Welcome, everyone, to the Codesultant channel. Grounding of separately derived systems is divided into two parts. The first part, addresses separately derived systems within grounded systems under 250.30a. And the second part, is for separately derived systems within ungrounded systems under 250.30b. Our focus today is on the grounding of separately derived systems for grounded systems as outlined in section 250.30a. Without any delay, let's bond once again on this very captivating topic. Section 250.30 mandates that grounding for separately derived systems must adhere not only to the regulations outlined in sections 250.30a and 250.30b, but separately derived systems must also adhere to the provisions in 250.20, 250.21, or 250.26, depending on their applicability. Additionally, a detailed discussion on these sections can be found on my channel. I encourage you to check it out and watch the videos, as they will help you easily comprehend and understand all the points we cover in our discussion here today and in the following videos. Further, when multiple power sources of the same type are interconnected in parallel to create a unified system that supplies premises wiring, they are considered a single separately derived system. The installation of such a system must be carried out by the regulations stated in 250.30. According to the first informational note in this section, if the grounded conductor of an on-site generator is solidly connected through a terminal lug in a transfer switch to the grounded conductor from the service to the premises, it is not considered a separately derived system. In the provided example, the situation occurs when the alternate source transfer equipment does not involve any switching mechanism in the grounded conductor. As a result, the grounded conductor remains securely connected to the service-supplied grounded conductor while the alternate source is functioning and supplying power to the load being served. This means in the case of a generator configured with three poles plus neutral if the transfer switch utilized comprises only three poles, the neutral of the generator and other sources are linked to a common neutral. The neutral conductor is firmly interconnected to a grounded neutral conductor supplied by the service system. What if we bonded the neutral of this generator to the frame and connected that is connected to the grounding system of the premises? An objectionable current will flow to the neutral conductor of the generator. That bonding point is prohibited by section 250.24b. If only three poles are utilized, the generator is not classified as a separately derived system. If a four-pole transfer switch is utilized, with one pole designated for disconnecting the neutral, then the generator meets the criteria for being a separately derived system. For the second informational note, the minimum size of conductors that carry fault current is specified in section 445.13 which is the section about the ampacity of conductors for generators. The size of the system bonding jumper should be based on the requirements in Table 250.102 C. 1. to determine the minimum size. Additionally, the neutral conductor must have a minimum size equal to 12.5% of the cross-sectional area of the largest phase conductor, as discussed in 250.28. Furthermore, a main bonding jumper furnished as part of listed service equipment can also be used as the system bonding jumper for separately derived systems, without the need for any additional calculations, as discussed in 250.28. Grounding a separately derived AC system connected to a service grounded system, as outlined in section 250.30a. If the premises wiring is supplied by a service AC grounded system, such as a single phase, three wire, system, a three phase Y, 4-wire system, a high-leg delta, 4-wire system, or a corner-grounded delta, 3-wire system, in accordance to section 250.30a. Grounding for separately derived system must comply with 250.30a1 through a8. Further, this section prohibits the grounded conductor from being connected to non-current carrying metal parts of equipment being connected to the equipment grounding conductors, or being reconnected to the ground on the load side of the system bonding jumper. This rule has been specified in section 250.24b. This is not allowed because it introduces parallel paths for neutral current on the load side. When the grounded conductor, typically the neutral, is connected to the panel enclosure or any conductive metal components of electrical equipment at the load side of the service disconnect, it leads to the flow of neutral current into unintended paths such as metal piping, cable trays, cable sheets, and similar pathways. 
This flow of neutral current is commonly referred to as an objectionable current. However, there is a section that allowed the grounded conductor to be grounded again under specific conditions, which we will find out in the following sections. It's worth noting that rules regarding connections at separate buildings or structures can be found in section 250.32, while the utilization of the grounded circuit conductor for grounding equipment is covered in section 250.142. An exception applies to impedance grounded neutral systems, where grounding connections should be made as specified in 250.36 or 250.187, depending on the circumstances at hand. The unspliced system bonding jumper must comply with the specific requirements outlined in sections 250.28, A, through, D. This bonding connection must be made at a single point on the separately derived system, starting from the source up to the first system disconnecting means or overcurrent device. Since the main bonding jumper and the system bonding jumper perform the same function, the system bonding jumper must comply with the requirements specified in sections 250.28, A, through, D. According to section 250.28, A, the system bonding jumper must be made of copper, aluminum, copper-clad aluminum, or other corrosion-resistant material. The system bonding jumper construction can be in the form of a wire, bus, screw, or similar conductor, and the connection to the system bonding shall be made using the methods specified in section 250.8, such as terminal lugs or bars. The size of the system bonding conductor is selected from table 250.102, C, 1, as specified in section 250.28, D. For sample sizing and calculation, you can refer to your previous video. The system bonding jumper connection must be made at a single point on the separately derived system. This single point is established as the connection for the grounding electrode, which connects the equipment grounding conductors to the grounded circuit conductors. This connection is specifically installed at the separately derived system, as shown in the illustration. In another illustration, the system bonding jumper is located within the first disconnecting means or overcurrent device of the separately derived system. Further, the location of the system bonding jumper and the connection to the grounding electrode conductor must occur at the same point. Therefore, the system bonding jumper is required and permitted to be installed at only one location on the separately derived system, either at the source of the separately derived system, or at the first system disconnecting means or overcurrent device. This single point for the grounding and bonding connection is intended to reduce the likelihood of parallel paths for neutral current. Alternatively, if the separately derived system has no disconnecting means or overcurrent devices, the system bonding jumper must be made at the source, by either section 250.30, A, 1, A, or 250.30, A, 1, B. The system bonding jumper is required to remain within the same enclosure where it originates. However, if the source of the separately derived system is located outside the building or structure being supplied, a system bonding jumper must be installed at the grounding electrode connection, as per section 250.30, C. Thank you all for watching.